spotlighting Hawaii's leaders. We want to bring in Governor David E. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. Lieutenant Governor, good morning. Thanks so much for joining us. Mayor Derek Kawakami. Thank you so much, uh, Senator, for being here. Spotlighting the issues. Where is the virus right now in our community? How much is this overall going to cost the state? How are you responding to the community's concerns? Talk about the level of citations that you guys are writing. Spotlight Hawaii with Yanji Denise and Ryan Kalei Suji on the digital platforms of the Honolulu Star Advertiser. This episode of Spotlight Hawaii is brought to you by Chaminade University. Aloha, good morning. Welcome to Spotlight Hawaii. I'm Yanji Denise, joined by Ryan Kalei Suji. We're so happy to see so many of you logging on. Remember to type your questions in the comments for us. Today, Ryan, we are heading over to Hawaii Island. That's right. We're island hopping here and joining us from the county building in Hilo is Hawaii County Mayor uh, Mitch Roth. Good morning, Mayor. Thanks so much for joining us. Good morning. Aloha. Great to see you again. Thanks so much for being here. Let's start off talking, of course, about COVID-19 and uh, what's happening there on the Big Island. If you can provide us an update about uh, the overall response uh, to COVID-19 and where you guys are at right now there on Hawaii Island. You know, um, like the rest of the state, our numbers have been coming down. Our hospitals are in a much better position than they were um, just a month ago. Um, our ICUs numbers have come down. The number of people, for example, at Hilo Medical Center, I think is seven in our in our hospitals, although we, we do have uh, some people that they don't count as COVID because they've already um, passed that 24 day time. Um, so we still have some of those lingering patients in there, um, but we do have room in our ICUs. And so we, we feel a lot more comfortable than we have in the past. And what do you think made the difference for, for the Big Island? Because unlike uh, Oahu, for instance, you did not implement a safe access, you know, like the ver vaccine verifications for certain venues. You did limit gathering sizes. Um, how is the vaccination rate going? What do you think has attributed to the declining cases? You know, I, I think as you look around the world um, with the Delta variant, it seems to have gone up quickly and come down quick. And so we're kind of um, like every place else, we do have a community that has taken a lot of responsibility, made their kuleana. Um, so our, our vaccination rates have been pretty good. Um, people have been taking it serious. They've been socially distancing. Um, and, you know, the, the our healthcare workers have, have been out there. I think everybody has played a part to the numbers coming down. Uh, it's just, you know, everybody taking the, their little pieces of uh, responsibility and making it their kuleana. I think that's what's brought our numbers down. You know, there have been calls by some to ask the governor to implement a statewide vaccine verification system so that it is not different for each island. Uh, of course, as Yanji mentioned, Hawaii County choosing not to go that route. Uh, if the governor decides to consider that, is that something that you would uh, oppose or, or would you support a statewide mandate overall? You know, um, I didn't come into this job to to mandate people to vaccinate or not vaccinate. We've highly recommended uh, vaccinations, and we continue to do that. You know, especially now as we see um, some of the people that have been uh, coming into our hospitals maybe a little bit older, um, and you know, most of our our older communities have uh, our seniors, our kapunas have already got their vaccinations. But with a booster shot, we know that they're going to be a, a lot safer. Um, but it, it, as far as uh, making it my priority to object to it, I, I can see if the governor does it, um, but I, I'm, I'm not really pushing it at this time. I think that we're past the, the stage of, of where we were, where it was critical. We are entering the holiday season, which means there will be a lot more travel, uh, not only for tourists coming in, but also for Kama'aina. And with that, we've seen community spread. One of the things that you had suggested to hopefully limit community spread was to publish the names of those who had elected to self-quarantine if they were not vaccinated upon return to the state. Is that something you're still pushing for? When we had asked the governor about it, he did say that the attorney general was looking into the legality of it. So where does that stand right now? It, it's still with the governor um, and and the AG, and the idea is to create you know a database so that it can be published. Um, there's other things that are happening. One of the things that's happening, of course, on the 
the federal uh, side, uh, Congress is looking at the possibility of requiring everybody who travels to be vaccinated. I think if, if that was to happen, then it, we wouldn't need to have uh, a law that would require people to, um, you know, or, or to have this, this list available. Uh, I still think it's a good idea. I, I, you know, coming from my previous profession as a prosecutor, um, if we have rules and laws, we should be able to enforce them. And I think that if we don't have, uh, you know, something out there that says that uh, you have to be vaccinated before you travel, um, this allows us to uphold our laws. And, you know, I, th I think it's a good idea. I still think it's a good idea. One of the other things that we're hearing a lot of debate over is this testing option. I, you know, as, as people begin planning for holiday travel and as we welcome back international visitors uh, and the new mandates that will come with those who are coming from international uh, borders uh, and having to have that test mandate as well as that v proof of vaccination, do you think that the testing option should be something that the state should also incorporate into the safe travels program uh, not only for international visitors but for those who are traveling from the u.s mainland and requiring some form of testing uh, before traveling or do you think that the vaccination itself and just being vaccinated uh, is enough i'm sorry Ryan. you know um we have a, a instable um, connection today unfortunately but let me see if I can answer this in, in the simplest way possible. I think that we should have uniform rules that uh, cover international as well as trans-Pacific travelers that are coming in. And, and would you support adding another layer of testing? Do you think that there should be more, you know, early on in the pandemic when safe travels was first implemented, uh, you had to be tested three days or within 72 hours before coming into the state. Would you support reinstating something like that, knowing that we are going to have a busy holiday season? Yeah, you know, I, I, I would support uh, putting additional testing um, on certain types of people. I mean, people who haven't, uh, been vaccinated, um, or who, yeah, uh, or who haven't been tested. I, I think we should have that additional testing at the airport. And sorry, we're breaking up a little bit. You're coming through uh, fine on our end, so we apologize if on on your end if you can't hear us. But y you sound great on on our side, so uh, oh, hopefully good. we can continue <laughs> on this conversation as best as we can. But we appreciate your patience. Uh, expanding more on uh, COVID-19 and uh, what's happening. What do you think the future looks like moving forward uh, as we enter 2022? Uh, how do you see the county, um, you know, really trying to adjust to the times uh, with COVID-19, with booster shots also being a part of the equation as well? Uh, how do we move forward and how do you move forward as a county while incorporating some of these protocols for COVID-19? Well, you know, um, the future is is kind of interesting. Uh, you know, we're talking about probably seeing different variants um, probably for the next year or two. But at the same time, we see different medication uh, applications and different abilities. We have a now, a, I guess, a pill that can be taken. Um, I, I think that uh, and we have the monoclonal antibodies as well. So I, I'm hoping that we can start to open up and uh, get back to a new normal where um, you know people are able to travel, people are able to go to meetings, um, and we're 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 safer. We're not quite there yet, but I, I think uh, we should start seeing a lot more th activities. For example, outdoors and easing um, the outdoor restrictions, making sure that our kids are able to go out and you know play making sure that uh, people are out there, you know, getting sunshine, vitamin D and, and other things that, you know, keep your immune system healthy as well. On that subject, how long do you expect to keep uh, gathering size restrictions in place? And what are the metrics that you're looking at specific to your county when you're trying to decide, you know, how, how soon to lift those? You know, we uh, chose to go to 1010 and we're at that 10, 10, 10 indoors, 10 outdoors uh, for a lot longer than I'd hoped. Um, but one of the reasons why we we're at that 10, 10, and now we're at 10, 25, uh, was during the 10, 10, 10 indoors, 10 outdoors, our hospitals were, um, you know, 
in a really dire situation um, where our ICUs had more patients than we had uh, licensed ICU beds, which put a, a strain on our emergency rooms, which you know made it difficult for people who had heart attacks or were in a car crashes to get you know immediate uh, assistance. We're not in that situation, so we opened it up to 1025. Um, and we're looking at making further openings as you know we see our healthcare providers in a better situation, as we see um, new treatments that are available, and as we see our numbers come down and, and fewer people dying. One of the things that has also been impacted is large events and gatherings. We know that the Ironman, which is a big event there on Hawaii Island, uh, not only does it uh, you know, bring a lot of people, but a lot of money into the local economy. Uh, talk about your efforts to ensure uh, that events like that come back. And, and what are some of the things that you are doing to help to ensure that those types of marquee events that are critical to the economy there uh, do continue on beyond just the restrictions that are currently in place? You know, it's really interesting, you know, during this um, last several months, um, Honolulu chose not to have any large events. Um, we've actually allowed large events um, and it, large is a, is a, you know, is a question how, how large, um, but we've uh, allowed, uh, you know, events with up to 100 people. Um, the way we did that is people had to fill out event request forms we had to take a look at what kind of protocols they had. They had safety protocols. They were able to have their weddings. Um, some of the weddings that we had, uh, actually most of the weddings that we had that had you know, maybe 75 or 100 people, um, there was protocols where they didn't have dancing, um, but you know, they wanted to get married and we wanted them to have this, this ability. We've now re relaxed some of those uh, protocols and um, we have, we've actually been having large events all the way um, during this period of time. We just have been making sure that people are doing it in a safe manner. And I'm proud to say that out of all the events that we had um, during this, this period where we've been able to allow for events, I, I don't think we've had any cluster uh, come out of those events because people took um, those protocols serious. The businesses especially knew that um, if they didn't, the possibility of, you know, uh, other events happening would not happen. Now, things like the Iron Man, um, we were in conversations with them, and you know, unfortunately, Iron Man was scheduled for the time when, you know, the numbers were really coming up, and so through mutual conversations with them, it was decided, um, actually, by the Iron Man uh, group as well as the county talking together. Um, not to have that event, but they're coming back next year. And, you know, we're now looking at things like Merry Monarch. And, you know, we did Merry Monarch. It was a virtual event. Um, maybe it will happen um, at the auditorium with just less people than, than you know, it has in the, in the past. And then again, if we have COVID under control in the next couple of months, we may be looking at what they're doing on the mainland as well. But all, all these things are, are, are through conversations and um, you know, trying to work together with the event because none of the event um, promoters want to have a, a cluster come out of it. Everybody's been really good that, that we've been talking to and uh, we've been able to make things happen and we intend on continuing to make things happen. Just it may not look the way it has in the past. Of course, one of the things to stop the spread is testing. And Damon has a question here wanting to know, how long will Hawaii County keep paying for community testing? We know that there have been CARES Act money and ARPA funds that have been released to the counties. Uh, how much is, are you devoting to testing and, and how long will that continue? Yeah, and that's a great uh, question. Um, the testing that we're paying for right now is all coming from um, the ARPA funds and, and you know, FEMA funds and, and things like that. So they're federal funds. As long as those funds are available, um, you know, it's part of our of our um, plan to spend those monies. Um, and so some of those monies are actually focused on 
on testing. Um, so how long we have the monies and how we're using the other monies, um, at least until I think the end of the year. One of the things that also the state is planning for is ramping up efforts uh, that will uh, will get underway for children that qualify for uh, the vaccination. Uh, have you been in contact with the State Department of Health uh, in terms of how the counties will help to implement and, and provide vaccination for children who are uh, eligible and parents who want to get their children vaccinated? If, if you can speak to the efforts that are being made and the coordination to see that that uh, gets underway smoothly. Yeah, you know, uh, Hawaii County is in regular contact with the Department of Health, our, our district health officer, uh, Jason De La Cruz. We are probably meeting with him uh, several times a week. Um, we also meet with Dr. Char and the governor and the other mayors twice a week. Um, so there's there's a lot of conversations and a lot of work that uh, goes into this. Um, you know, unlike some of the other counties, Hawaii, um, County of Hawaii does not have its own Department of Health. Um, so we really rely on the state. But that being said, there's a lot that we do to work together with them to make sure that, you know, um, things are happening. We, we've, you know, we've just talked about the county helping to, to uh, pay for and set up uh, testing. That really isn't a, a county role, but it's something that we find ourselves, you know, partnering up because it needs to be done. You know, the holidays are coming up as we reference, and I'm just interested on a personal note, you've spoken at length before about how your kids are off, uh, you know, not on island, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, wh what are you planning for in your own holiday plans and what are you recommending to residents as they start to decide whether or not to travel and who to have come to their house and what those gatherings should look like? Well, I know that at least one of my, my children, um, Alexander, who you're friends with, uh, is actually uh, uh, planning on coming back to Hawaii so we're, we'll spend a little bit of time with her. Uh, you know, as as the numbers come down everywhere, um, we just ask that people be mindful um, that we still have a virus out there to, you know, distance themselves, wear masks when appropriate, um, and, you know, to take care of their immune systems. And if you haven't been vaccinated or haven't got the booster and you're, eight, and you're eligible to get the booster, get the booster, get vaccinated. I want to switch gears here and talk about uh, some other issues that are happening on your island. One of them, uh, including some of the infrastructure uh, and the roadways there uh, on the big island, specifically with bridges. Uh, we know that there is some work being done on the Kole Kole Bridge uh, and some weight limits that have caused uh, some rerouting of trucks. Uh, we know that we've seen some of those long lines uh, at Puanako now because of the uh, overflow that now has to go through Saddle Road. Uh, and some of the trucks that now take that route because of that. Uh, if you can talk overall about the plans that are happening right now and some of the aging bridges and what that means overall to the infrastructure and travel uh, for you know going around the island and knowing that there are some important roadways that play a critical access point that uh, will have to undergo some repairs. Yeah, you know, it, it's it's really interesting. Um, the area where Kole Kole is, Kole Kole is actually a state bridge, but we also have a couple of county bridges that unfortunately are in that same area that actually are, are, are down at the same time um, or can't take the, the large loads. So on the county side, we're working with FEMA to make sure that we have the funds to, to um, bring our bridges up. On the state side, we're working with the state and the state is working on the Kole Kole Bridge. Uh, they went from four tons to now 12 tons, which allows you know vehicles to pass. They do have people who are by those bridges and, uh, you know, allowing cars. They're working very diligently. Um, we're hoping that they're back up in the next couple of months. Um, it's going to cause us to close uh, one of our parks while the work gets done. Um, but, you know, um, it, it's unfortunate. We, you know, one of the things that surprised me most coming in as mayor is how, how much money, how much need our infrastructure is. You know, our, our county budget's like 600 million um, with everything. Our bridges and roads alone, um, just to fix that infrastructure, were easily over a billion dollars. And then you add things like our wastewater, which is probably another $2 billion to repair. Um, there's no easy answers, but you know, I, I think as with everything else, 
the more partnerships you build, the easier uh, the work becomes. And, you know, this is one that uh, the state needs to work with us and we need to work with the state. And luckily we have very good relationships with our state department of transportation. Uh, another thing that's going to cost a lot of money, of course, is the lava buyout program. The next phase of that is set to begin. Can you talk about the level of interest you've seen from property owners there and how you, how that, how you think that program is going? You know, I, I was spectacal, uh, spectacal, um, <laughs> Skeptical, I, I think. <laughs> skeptical, skeptical. Well, I'll tell you that. My, my words aren't coming in. Skeptical uh, coming in to this job um, uh, about that whole program, but it is actually very, very well received. Um, I think in the first round, we had uh, 300 applicants. Uh, 91 of those have already been taken care of. Um, there's $107 million in grant funds. We start our, uh, our buyback program for the second phase today. And uh, it, it is actually working a lot better and it has been a lot uh, better received uh, than I thought it was this time last year when I was getting ready to take, uh, take this office. And um, the team that is working on this, um, they are super diligent. They're doing a, an amazing job. Um, and I, I'm just, I'm really proud to, to work with them and They've, uh, they've made a believer out of me. One of the things that we've been talking to all the mayors about are the changes that are happening, of course, to the TAT and the structure of what the counties can receive and how the state uh, will also be taking now a por the portion of that and allowing the counties to then uh, take an additional uh, up to 3% for uh, those who are visiting through the hotel tax and just the overall changes and what that means to the tax infrastructure of the county and the things that they have to implement. Uh, how are you receiving uh, the news of, of all this new thing, you know, this new uh, structure, if you will, that has been passed? And how will the county manage that moving forward? Yes. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, I, I think we're in a situation where we need to, to pass a, a, an ordinance and they're working on that right now. And so it's been put forward. Um, we have about a... a $19 million hole that, that needs to be filled. And like I said earlier, the amount of funds that the county has and the needs that the county has are, you know, miles apart. Um, so, you know, I, I look forward to seeing what they put forward. I, I'm hoping that it just fills the needs that we have and they don't start uh, earmarking things, um, funds for, for, for different things because, um, our OPEB, which is like the the benefits uh, package, um, we were able to not pay for this year and, and next, um, but those funds eventually have to be paid. That's that's easily 19, 21 million dollars a year. And if we have a year like we had in 2019, which was the, the year that we did best, um, we'll break even. But if we have years like we had in 2018, 17, 16, 15, then we're gonna be short on funds. And so uh, it's a necessary evil. Um, and what's really um, difficult is that the state really didn't give us a, um, a roadmap on how to do it. You know, I think that a lot of the legislators thought that, oh, well, the state can collect this money and, and pass it through to the counties well, uh, Attorney General um, did some research and said, you know, the law doesn't allow that to happen. And so uh, I think all of the counties are trying to work together to figure out what the best way is to collect. And, um, you know, for some of us, uh, it may mean having to hire more employees. Um, and so it, it's, it's a difficult situation, but it's, you know, I think we have to pass the bill and I think we have to collect the funds, uh, even at a time when that may uh, put a dent in, in tourism, because some people, it may price them out of a, a trip to Hawaii. Yeah, I mean, just the infrastructure alone on that, having to stand up essentially a whole office to do that, how soon do you think you'll actually be able to start to collect that money? Um, you know, I think it will take a couple of months to, to pass the, the ordinance. And um, depending on uh, on how things work, 
it, it will probably take us several months to collect some of that money. Um, and then it, it may take a little bit longer to figure out how to collect the rest of that money. You know, and when discussions were happening towards the end of the legislative session and there was talks that this could happen, uh, we know that you uh, have publicly stated also that it not only affects the visitors, but also the Kama Aina travelers and the impact that it will have on local families being able to travel to neighbor islands, but still having to pay this higher mm -hmm. tax overall. Uh, knowing that this is now moving forward, are, are conversations like that still something that you would like to have with the legislature to see if there is a way for Kama Aina to be exempted from this additional tax? Or, or what does that look like moving forward in your, the relationship that the county has with the legislature in trying to see if there's amendments that can be made to make this a uh, a stronger maybe version of what is currently in place. You know, I, I think it is something that we should be talking to the legislature about. Um, you know, maybe they, they take that off on the state end um, because each county has their own ordinances that they're, that they're passing. Um, I, I think we still need to talk to the legislature about some fixes even to, to what they've passed um, to possibly allow the state uh, agencies to help us a little bit more on this. We are almost out of time, but I do want to give you an opportunity to share some good news from uh, your county going onto the world stage in uh, Copenhagen to talk about climate change. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, you know, we've been uh, working on sustainability since day one of our administration. We had a sustainability summit that uh, you can see on the Leo TV. And um, we've had people from around the world taking notice of what we're doing. And we were invited to um, host a TED Talks um, based on climate change for COP26, which is the, the World uh, Climate uh, Summit. Uh, and um, so we have some amazing speakers uh, that will be sharing what, you know, they're doing here in Hawaii that, you know, affects the world and affects our climate. And what I like to say is that we, we have people that, are not thinking globally, acting locally. We have people that are actually uh, thinking locally, acting globally, that are really changing our, our environment and, and making a better world for all of us. And I have to correct myself. I believe the summit is in Scotland, not in Denmark. So apologies there. Okay. <laughs> but, but, <laughs> but that is wonderful to see that the ideas that are happening right here at home are going to be shared around the world. Yeah. And it, uh, it's it's really kind of neat um, when they start when they were looking at uh, different localities they put it out and uh, I think we were the only United States uh, locality that was chosen um, to to host one of these these TED talks and uh, you know November thirteenth it will be part of the COP twenty six um, we have some just amazing speakers. Uh, that are gonna be uh, presenting. And so our TED Talks will be presented uh, at Glasgow. All right, well, great to hear uh, Hawaii County representing uh, the state as well as the country well in, in some of these global discussions. And thank you so much, uh, Mira, for being a part of this conversation this morning and update us on things that are happening there in uh, on Hawaii Island. Thank you so much. All right, thank you guys. Aloha. Aloha. Wonderful to hear from him. We got an update and he sounds like a lot of the leaders that we've been speaking to recently, cautiously optimistic about where they are when it comes to case counts and hospitalizations. Uh, you know, they had Hilo Medical Center, uh, you know, we had representatives on from them at the height of the Delta surge here in the islands and they were really struggling having to even convert part of their maternity ward into a COVID unit. Now they obviously are not in that circumstance. And so he is allowing some of the rules uh, to be relaxed going to increase gathering sizes outside. And he did say that he is looking at that uh, in the near future to perhaps lift further restrictions as well. Yeah, I'm saying that there could be uh, further amendments that are made that move a lot for larger groups as long as those numbers continue to stay consistent. Uh, you can hear uh, also the, just the sense of optimism that they have about being able to welcome in some of the larger groups already talking about bringing back the Ironman, uh, of course, that was rescheduled because of the Delta surge during that time and the impacts that it had overall to the economy. But noting that uh, there is efforts being made right now to ensure that they are coming back 
uh, to Hawaii Island. It's such an important event there on the Kona coastline. Uh, we also heard about the uh, implementation of the vaccine program for children, that they continue to work with the state and the Department of Health to ensure that the county will be ready to hand out those vaccinations to those children and parents who would like their children to receive that vaccination, which again could be coming up as early as uh, in the earlier part of next month. That's right. Uh, he also talked about uh, one of the things that's dr uh, drawn a little bit of controversy, and that is his uh, suggestion of perhaps making public the names of those who elect to self-quarantine. That is something that he is still interested in. He says he still thinks it's a good idea. We've asked other leaders uh, in the state, and no one else has adopted that stance. But uh, he had said in the past that they simply don't have the manpower to enforce all the self-quarantine. So this could be a way to make sure that people are abiding by the quarantine that they elect to do. Um, he does not sound like he'll be adopting any kind of a vaccine verification program at the county level, uh, but that we do know that that is something that uh, Governor Ige is always considering. Yeah, and also just hearing his thoughts about the changes to the TAT and how uh, the county will have to stand up some of those resources now to be able to manage that on their end and the overall impact uh, that some of the infrastructure issues will have on the county budget moving forward, knowing that the bridges and roadways uh, there in Hawaii Island need some upgrades. And he's saying that they will continue to work with federal and state partners to try to see uh, whatever help that they can get, knowing that there is a large price tag that will be attached to that, that ultimately also could be impacted by some of these changes to the tax structure of the TAT. Yeah, and just hearing about all the projects that are going on when it comes to infrastructure, and he talked about water and then also lava buyback. The county certainly needs those funds, so it'll be paramount to figure out how to get them. Uh, on Friday, we're going to be talking to Osa Tui Jr. He, of course, is the head of the Hawaii State Teachers Association. The union there expressing their frustration with the current COVID protocols in some schools, saying that uh, they don't think that it is safe enough for a lot of teachers. And so we're going to be talking to him about that and also about uh, what it could mean to have more children vaccinated in schools, uh, you know, his thoughts on that. So we look forward to our conversation with the head of the HT HSTA on Friday. We'll see you then. Have a great rest of your week. Aloha. This episode of Spotlight Hawaii was brought to you by Chaminade University.